Most Brits today probably couldn't name their first Prime Minister of the UK, Robert Walpole. This is less about the man himself, who still holds the record for longest serving PM at nearly 21 years, and more about the way our constitution works. Robert Walpole didn't win some war, or radically alter the constitution, or anything else that really set him apart from those who had come before him, for indeed, Walpole, by any objective measure, is not our first Prime Minister. So this raises the question, why does everyone agree that he was? Part 1. The History of the Prime Minister Like all good things in British politics, the term Prime Minister began as an insult, used by the opposition against Walpole in the 1730s. It wasn't formalised until 1905 under Henry Campbell Bannerman. Walpole certainly never called himself a PM. The term Prime Minister refers to the person who holds the office of the First Lord of the Treasury, which means that they are the Chair of the Treasury Commission, which also contains the Chancellor and the Junior Whips, who have no control over finances. This office, the First Lord of the Treasury, was created not in 1721 when Walpole's Prime Ministership began, but in 1714. Adding to this confusion, the Commission was created to replace the office of Lord High Treasurer, we really love our over-the-top titles, because they had been deemed to have become too powerful. Could an argument be made, therefore, that the predecessor to the first Lord of the Treasury, the Lord High Treasurer, were in fact Prime Ministers? In fact, the Commission set up in 1714 wasn't even the first Treasury Commission. That was in 1612, with the Earl of Northampton, Henry Howard, as the first Lord, and as Chancellor, this fine gentleman, who went by the name of Julius Caesar. Although it didn't last very long, just over a year, there were a total of 19 commissions sprinkled in between the Lord High Treasurers before the office of Lord High Treasurer was abolished forever. Did none of these commissions count? And if not, why not? So, we are presented with three different measures for working out who was the first Prime Minister. The first, and least controversial, is the one where we consider only the first Lords of the Treasury after the office of Lord High Treasurer was permanently abolished in 1714, meaning we consider only potential PMs beyond this point. This is Walpole's best definition in terms of being an early PM, but as you can see, he doesn't grab the top spot, as there's a seven year gap between the last Lord High Treasurer and the beginning of Walpole's official Prime Ministerial tenure. Our first PM would instead be the Earl of Halifax, First Lord from October 1714 to May 1715, and our second, the Earl of Carlisle, who held the role from May to October 1715. Interestingly, we then have Robert Walpole as our third PM, until April 1717, for he did serve as First Lord of the Treasury for two years, before his time as PM officially begins. Even if we discounted Halifax and Carlisle for being so short-lived, surely we would date Walpole's Prime Ministership from 1715, rather than 1721 as we currently do. This would maintain Walpole as the first PM, but introduce two new ones, James Stanhope from 1717 to 1718, and the Earl of Sunderland from 1718 to 1721, neither of whom are currently counted as Prime Ministers. Our second measure, then, could take into account those who had the same title as Walpole, and indeed every PM since, First Lord of the Treasury, but were around before the alternative Lord High Treasurer had been permanently discarded. That means we include all of the First Lords of the Treasury on this timeline. Our first PM in that case would be Henry Howard, and Walpole would be the 18th individual to be PM, and the 22nd separate Prime Ministerial term. Looking at this group of people, you might notice a few things. The first is that both Halifax and Carlisle were First Lords of the Treasury before the 1714 cutoff, which emphasises how that cutoff is only useful in retrospect, now that we know that the Lord High Treasurer is never coming back. Another candidate to note is Sidney Godolphin, who was First Lord three separate times for a total of nearly nine years. If he was included in the list of PMs, he would be about the 11th longest serving out of 56. If length of tenure matters at all, as it would have to in order to discount Halifax and Carlisle from our previous measure, then discounting Godolphin seems odd. Whilst we're on the subject, the Earl of Sunderland is not insignificant either, with a three-year tenure that would place him 33rd out of 56, just edging out Theresa May. The third measure, which would include the Lord High Treasurer, would date our first Prime Minister as Bishop Nigel, no last name given, who held the post between 1126 and 1133. As we look at this image, it becomes clear that none of our measures are sufficient. Obviously, the reason why Walpole is our first PM is not because of some foolproof historical equation. There must be something else, something more personal to Walpole himself. The only way to find out would be to examine his time as Prime Minister, and see what it was that made historians single him out from the rest. Part 2. Walpole's Rise to Power Robert Walpole was born in Norfolk in 1676 to a very wealthy family. They were also established in politics. His father, also helpfully called Robert Walpole, was an MP for Castle Rising, 
Walpole's education was indicative of his position in society. He attended the prestigious Eton College from 1690 to 96, and the University of Cambridge from 1696 to 98. When Walpole's father died in 1700, Walpole inherited his estates and job as an MP. Thankfully, nepotism such as this has been completely eradicated from British politics. Walpole then became Whig MP for Kings Lynn, also in Norfolk, in 1702, which he held almost without interruption until 1742. As an MP, Walpole had a few attributes which helped him stand out from the crowd. He was a skilled administrator with strong business acumen, and he was extremely rich. Walpole rose through the ranks quickly. He was appointed as an advisor to the Lord High Admiral and Queen's husband, Prince George of Denmark, where he distinguished himself as an academic and a mediator. He was made Secretary of War in 1708, but after the Tories took power in 1710, Walpole's position became more tenuous. He was charged with corruption for his involvement in the prosecution of a Tory preacher, and was imprisoned in the Tower of London for six months during 1712, the only time he was not an MP for King's Lynn over his 40-year tenure. He became a martyr for the Whig cause, and by 1713 was out and back in Parliament. A quick side note on the Whigs and Tories, seeing as I'll mention them quite a lot during this video. Like the term Prime Minister, the names Whigs and Tories started out as insults, translating roughly to Scottish horse thieves and Irish outlaws respectively. These political parties were very different to the kind we have today. They were quite informal, fluctuated wildly in power, and officially only made up of about half of Parliament, the rest of MPs being independents or appointed by the Crown. It was common for the monarch to form a government with both Whigs and Tories. In fact, it was a norm, and arguments tended to be fought not over partisan lines, but over government opposition lines. The court party, made up of the Whigs and Tories in government and their allies, including all of the Crown-appointed MPs, versus the country party, consisting of the Whigs and Tories out of government. Because of this, the two parties are quite hard to define ideologically, but a massively oversimplified way of thinking about them is that the Whigs were more reform-minded whilst the Tories were more conservative and traditional. However, note that because nothing in history can ever make logical sense, these Tories are not the same as the modern-day Conservative Party, who are often called Tories. Anyhow, back to Walpole. In 1714, Queen Anne died without leaving an heir to the Stuart throne. There were fears that the Catholic Jacobites, descendants of the exiled James II, would attempt to return and seize power, led by the now 16-year-old James III. Instead, the German George I was chosen to be king in the Act of Settlement 1701, despite being about 50th in line for the throne, mostly because all other options were Catholic or similarly undesirable. Supported more by the Whigs and the Tories, who were suspected of harbouring Jacobite sympathies, George unsurprisingly stopped his government with Whigs. After Halifax and Carlisle's short-lived ministries, Walpole was appointed First Lord of the Treasury in 1715, beginning his first stint at the job that would later be called Prime Minister. During this time, a rift developed between the Whigs. On one side, Walpole and his brother-in-law Charles Townshend, on the other, the Earl of Sutherland and James Stanhope. The disagreement was over foreign policy. Walpole argued that UK foreign policy was being hijacked by George I to cater to his Hanoverian interests. In 1717, Walpole and Townshend resigned in protest, and became key members of the opposition, Walpole in particular being instrumental in defeating the Peerage Bill of 1719, which would have limited the monarch's ability to create peerages. Walpole's resignation led to the most egregious of the Prime Ministerial snubbings, the two Stanhope Sunderland ministries, in which both served alternately as First Lord of the Treasury. Why are neither included in the list of Prime Ministers? Did they have relatively short tenures compared to Walpole's exclude them? Is it simply because Walpole is a cooler first PM? Do historians just hate Sunderland? Whatever the reason, Stanhope and Sunderland had picked a bad time to leave the country. Whilst Walpole was networking with the heir to the throne Prince George and his wife Caroline, the government was headed for financial disaster. The South Sea Company was a trading corporation which had been granted a monopoly over commerce with the Caribbean, Spain and South America to reduce the national debt. Walpole, in his earlier years, saw this as a golden investment opportunity, and was one of the first to start buying shares. However, he was certainly not the last. More people bought shares, so the price went up, so more people bought shares, expecting a return on their investment, so the price went up. This continued until it got, to use a technical economic term, silly. New companies were founded to cash in on the bubble, pitching ideas such as manufacturing square cannonballs, or in one case that money from shares would be used for carrying on an undertaking of great advantage, but no one to know what it is. Despite being the Nigerian prince scam of its day, this somehow worked, prompting roughly £2,000 of investment, or just over 400000 in today's money, on that company alone. As with all bubbles, however, it eventually burst in 1720. This caused the South Sea Company to go bankrupt, along with thousands of investors, including ordinary people who had clubbed together to buy shares. 
Walpole, meanwhile, had made a tidy profit. Not only had he invested before it was cool, and so gotten his shares at rock bottom prices, he'd also gotten out before the bubble burst, not because of any personal skill, but on the advice of his banker, Robert Jacob. But few were as well off as Walpole. Angry crowds formed outside Parliament. The directors of the South Sea Company were arrested and their lands seized. A response to white-collar banking crime that thankfully has been upheld to this day, so that those who caused such an economic disaster would at the very least be punished. Back in 1720, Parliament got to blame. James Stanhope contracted smallpox and died in 1721, which is one way of avoiding scrutiny. Sunderland had launched the South Sea Company, and so was facing massive criticism and even prison. Walpole, who had artfully covered up his Rhondda scheme, persuaded the House of Commons Committee to acquit Sunderland, but the black cloud over Sunderland remained, and he resigned in April 1721, retiring to the House of Lords, where he stayed until his death a year later. Walpole's competition was gone. In April 1721, he was appointed First Lord of the Treasury, with Townshend as a key ally. This is the official date when Robert Walpole became Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Not quite what you expected, was it? Unless, of course, it was, in which case, good guess. But I certainly didn't expect that the story of how our first PM came to power would be so damning. Walpole not only contributed to and benefited from a massive economic disaster that ruined the lives of ordinary people and nobles alike, he covered up his involvement and used it as leverage to seize power. Surely dating Walpole's first ministry in 1715 would spare a few prime ministerial blushes, and perhaps be slightly more accurate. But no, Walpole is our first PM, not Halifax. Perhaps, then, the story of Walpole's 20 years in power will offer a better insight into why we seem so important that we accept skipping his predecessors. Part 3. Prime Minister Walpole The start of Walpole's tenure was defined by the fallout from the South Sea bubble. Walpole restored government credit through the heavily criticised sinking fund scheme, essentially setting money aside over a long period of time to pay off the debt. However, Walpole's popularity soon spiked for two reasons. First, the general election in 1722. A 1716 law had decreed that elections should happen every seven years. Previously, they had been frequent but sporadic. The election system in the UK at the time was pretty terrible. The electorate for each constituency was composed entirely of property owners, which meant there weren't that many voters, whilst constituencies were often rotten boroughs, where the electorate might just be one person accepting bribes from every angle. It was not uncommon for many MPs to be re-elected unopposed. It is difficult to imagine such a system being made worse, but Walpole found a way, bribing officials, rigging elections, and offering patronage in order to secure his majority. Moreover, the size of his majority, the Whig government won 389 seats to the Tories' 169, meant that he had even more resources to bribe with, and even more patronage to hand out. Quick side note, you may be wondering how this can be if there were so many independents and crown-appointed MPs as I claimed before. Looking back, historians often group these MPs into either the Whig or Tory camp, even though at the time they technically weren't members of those parties. Walpole's second big break was in uncovering a plot to bring down the government by the Tory Francis Atterbury in 1723. Atterbury was exiled, the Tories were branded as Jacobites once again, and Walpole's public and elite support skyrocketed. Walpole's best qualities as PM are hardly the stuff of legend, controlling the national debt and keeping the country out of war, but they were still impressive feats. In the 18th century, Britain was at war more often than not, but Walpole's tenure was for the most part peaceful. Walpole was also good at pulling strings. One of his nicknames was Screen Master General, a term similar to today's Puppet Master. Walpole forced the resignation of his Secretary of State, John Carteret, in 1724, and even his longtime ally, Townshend, in 1730. Although Walpole had a minor crisis in 1727, when George I died and George II ascended to the throne, his connections with Queen Caroline kept him in power, and by the time she died in 1737, Walpole was close enough to George that he didn't need her support. Indeed, George II gave Walpole some property as a gift, which may have been personal or for the office of the First Lord of the Treasury. Either way, Walpole adopted it as the official residence of the First Lord, and 10 Downing Street remains that today. Walpole's policies weren't always popular, however. In 1724, the first edition of the newspaper The Craftsman was published, hurling a torrent of abuse at Walpole that directed public resentment towards both him and Parliament. The Bribery Act of 1727 attempted to curtail Walpole's corruption, which in the general election of 1727 has led to another victory of 415 Whigs to 128 Tories and 15 Whig opposition MPs. Walpole's aversion to war was prudent but unpopular. For example, Walpole was instrumental in negotiating the Treaty of Seville in 1729 to persuade the Spanish not to notice it a bit of their country was English, and he convinced George II to stay out of the War of the Polish Succession in 1733, but this put his patriotism under question. 
In 1733, Walpole attempted to raise taxes on tobacco and wine, another example of his focus on cutting the national debt, but it was extremely unpopular, and he quickly U-turned and tried to blame the Whig opposition. This didn't work, as in the 1734 election, Walpole's fortunes sagged. He lost over 80 seats, dropping to 330, whilst the Tories won 145 and the Whig opposition 83. More bad news was just around the corner. In 1737, Walpole's wife died and although he remarried three months later, his new wife died in childbirth. In 1739, Walpole's biggest success, his ability to keep Britain out of war, was derailed, and in the most ridiculous way possible. The War of Jenkins's Ear, fought between Britain and Spain from 1739 to 48, was one of the many wars at this time fought over successions, in this case as part of the War of the Austrian Succession. Jenkins's Ear, however, had a rather odd origin. You might think that the war is named after a place, perhaps, called Jenkins's Ear, or a ship that was sunk, or something like that. But no, it is referring to a man named Jenkins and his ear. The Jenkins in question, Captain Robert Jenkins, claimed that his ship had been boarded by the Spanish, who had proceeded to cut off his ear. According to legend, Jenkins kept his ear in a jar, showed it to the House of Commons, and sure enough, war was declared the next year. There are historical debates about whether the Spanish actually did cut off Jenkins's ear, whether he did indeed show it to Parliament, which I will not get into. As is often the case with wars, what seemed like a good idea at the time quickly became a disaster, going poorly for the remainder of Walpole's tenure and beyond. At the 1741 election, the Whigs took yet another hit, falling to 286 seats, barely more than the combined Tories of 136 and the opposition Whigs of 131. Walpole, now aged 65 and in declining health, was under attack from all sides. His leadership of the war was criticised, his corruption and personal enrichment at the expense of the taxpayers being investigated by parliamentary committees, and his opponents, such as his delightfully named Tory leader, Watkin Williams Wynne, were numerous, united and powerful. In 1742, the House of Commons was about to determine the validity of a by-election in Chippenham. Side note, the House of Commons could just declare that elections invalid if they didn't like the result, and Walpole agreed to treat it as a motion of confidence, meaning that if the government lost the vote, they would be forced to resign. Walpole hoped that by doing this, some of those on the fence would support him, as they wouldn't want to take such drastic action as to depose the government. However, Walpole's last gamble failed. The government lost the vote, and Walpole resigned, on the condition that he would be given a peerage. He retired to the Lords, where he remained an advisor to George II, and watched the entirety of his successor, the Earl of Wilmington, short time in power, before Wilmington's death in 1743. The true head of the Wilmington ministry was Walpole's old, irritating Secretary of State, John Carteret, who he had sacked in 1724. Walpole, now known as the Minister Behind the Curtain, engineered the demise of Carteret's ministry in 1744 and the elevation of Walpole's protégé Henry Pellet, who had taken over as PM from Wilmington, to the true head of government. Walpole's health deteriorated rapidly towards the end of 1744, and he died on March 18, 1745, aged 68. Part 4. Conclusion So, why is Robert Walpole considered the first PM? The best answer is simply... Do you have a better idea? No systematic method would present Walpole as the first PM. Those would bring up the Earl of Halifax, or Henry Howard, or even Bishop Nigel. But why use a systematic method for something so loose and undefinable as the British Constitution? Walpole was the first PM too important to leave out. He held the office for 20 years and demonstrated how much power the King's advisers could have far better than his predecessors, even if he did often use that power for personal gain. The monarch had been constrained since James II was dethroned in 1688, but nobody had truly taken full advantage of that fact until Walpole. It helps that he was the first person to be called Prime Minister, even though it was an insult and not until halfway through his tenure, and that he started many of the traditions, such as living in 10 Downing Street. In a truly cop-out answer, the reasons why Walpole was the first PM are nebulous and subjective, but in the same way that the British Constitution is nebulous and subjective. He's the first PM because historians decided he is, because it just seems right. Or perhaps they really do just hate Sunderland.